So today I am going to talk about what free software enthusiasts can do to build resilient technical projects and community structures that will help everyday citizens be able to take more control over their own destinies for the sake of building a better world. So uh, since we are here in Bristol in the United Kingdom, I thought I would take as my lens for this presentation uh, a hometown boy, Ben Elton. And if you're not familiar with the name Ben Elton, that's all right. I'm going to tell you all about who he is in just a moment. So um, before we get started properly, I do just want to let folks know that I'm going to be discussing some some difficult things this morning at the beginning of this presentation. Um, so there will be discussions of ecocide, genocide, homophobia, transphobia, US politics, um, other scary things. There will also be some plot spoilers. So the, the point of bringing this up is simply because if anyone in the audience is, isn't ready for that today, or if anyone watching the live stream isn't ready for that right now, um, this is an excellent opportunity to go ahead and, and tune out and uh, there will be no judgments. But I just wanted to let folks know it was coming as part of the beginning of this presentation. Fortunately, it won't last very long because I don't believe in giving talks that are gloom and doom without telling us which ways that we can be successful in overcoming those obstacles and, and actual tools that we can use to do so. so Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Mr. Ben Elton. Uh, he is well known as an Australian and British comedian. Uh, if you are a fan of shows like Blackadder, he was one of the lead writers for that show. Also for The Young Ones, he was responsible for the pilot of Mr. Bean, which I'm still desperately trying to forgive him for. And uh, he's also a prolific novelist. And I thought, given all the time that we spend in our communities, on social media, in our own entertainment, focusing on narratives of dystopia, that I would talk to you about two of his novels that to me are really the, uh, <coughs> if, we were to, if we were to decide how things were going to go down in the world in ways we didn't like, I see these two novels by Mr. Elton as representative of those future scenarios. So first, Stark. Uh, this is actually Mr. Elton's first novel, and the plot is that there are activists who are seeking to prevent the launch into space of uh, space vessels called star arcs, and the star arcs are meant to carry the wealthy and the privileged into space to live out their lives because the Earth has become so devastated that it will no longer be able to support life. So the wealthy and the privileged have chosen to take themselves away from that scenario. Um, <coughs> as I said, there will be plot spoilers. Uh, needless to say, the activists are unsuccessful in their efforts, but interestingly enough, and I think part of the most poignant lesson for Mr. Elton, is that those who find themselves in space are not well either within a very short period of time because it turns out they treat each other exactly the way they treated everyone else on planet Earth. So, uh, interesting lesson there. And uh, finally, what I thought actually was Mr. Elton's final novel, um, and I found out when I was researching Wikipedia that it was not, but Blind Faith. And Blind Faith is a novel uh, in the set in the near future. The Earth has been ravaged by the impact of climate change. Uh, their children are no longer vaccinated. Babies die in droves. And the watchword of their society is that only perverts do things in private. So society has voluntarily surrendered to living in a panopticon and there are absolutely no moments in which the individual is given time to have privacy or to be alone simply with your thoughts. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure that these dystopian futures don't sound uh, too ridiculous, and particularly not if we consider things like Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin Project, Elon Musk shooting off his mouth and shooting his car into space, and the fact that uh, you know we have through social media to some degree, chosen to voluntarily live in a panopticon where it is much more important how we perform our lives than necessarily to live them. So this is not fine, right? I don't, I don't think that I need to recount all of the things that are facing our world and everyone in this room, not because we're free software activists, but because we are humans and residents of planet Earth, um, you know, we have people who are separating children from their families at the border because they think that this is an effective deterrent to immigration. 
which is the direct result of colonialization and uh, economic hegemony based uh, on the part of governments like mine. Um, I moved to Europe, I escaped, that was very good. Um, <coughs> you know, we, we regularly hear effectively that we're living in an episode of Black Mirror, right? And we, as we look at the advancements of technology like artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as various IoT applications, the uh, you know, implications for citizen surveillance, for predatory sentencing laws, for machines effectively making bad decisions because humans have been very good at making bad decisions for a really long time, right? All of that is what is facing us now. We have the recent United Nations climate report that says we have about 10 years to figure out how to rework all of human society in order to prevent great catastrophe for our planet or ourselves. So uh, <coughs> we, have, we have governments legislating what it is to be a human being based on your gender. Uh, we have, it's, this is not fine, right? And I, I think that the, the point of me standing up here today is not to make people sad or unhopeful, it's to say that if we were all waiting for the time to get out there and do something and to make the world a better place, not just in our, our everyday actions, but to do something truly monumental, the time is now, right? We, do, we don't have any more time to wait. So as I said, um, we don't know, we, I don't think any of us are ignorant of history. I don't think any of us are ignorant of the problems that face us. I don't think any of us believe for a moment that uh, you know, it's, it's okay to not know history and that we will all be fine. We know that those who know not history are doomed to repeat it. I think the problem is that we are overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. There is fear and that's okay because change starts incrementally and I'm gonna talk about some incremental changes that we can make in our free software communities and in our daily lives, both through technical structures and community structures to hopefully contribute to uh, a happier future and one that is more just and inclusive for all. So, so now what, right? Uh, everything is, I'm not going to say that word because I have learned to be polite in my old age and not use the swears. So I'm gonna tell you this morning about five projects that mean something to me. Right, these are five uh, free and open source software projects that you can contribute your time to uh, to improve the world, if that's what you wish. And then we'll start talking a bit more about community structures. Uh, but before I get into these five projects, I also want to point out that clearly there is a free and open source software community that you can contribute your time and energy to that is Freenode, and that is why we are all here today. So clearly, if you have time and energy to give to that, please see Christelle or any of the other Freenode live staffers, and I'm sure that they would be happy to get you acquainted uh, with how you can contribute. And Christelle, for folks who are watching online, what's the best way for them to get involved with supporting Freenode? Okay, so wonderful. So what Christelle said was, if you'd like to get involved with supporting the Freenode community, please join slash Freenode on, or please join Pound Freenode on, uh, interestingly enough, the Freenode network, uh, or send an email and there will be folks who would be very happy to tell you how to get up to speed. So. Five projects that mean something to me. So the first one is Grow Stuff. And Grow Stuff is a free and open source software project with an aim to help uh, build an open source platform that helps people learn about how to grow food, track what they plant, and also to do seed swapping. And for folks who are not uh, gardeners like myself, this may seem like uh, you know funsies, but like what are the implications? And I would actually advocate that food sovereignty is one of the most important issues facing our world today. If our food supply is effectively controlled by a handful of companies, either through uh, genetic modifications, which render seeds sterile, or via, um, you know, it's actually illegal to trade seeds that you grow in your yard, depending on where you live, because it could be a food safety hazard, which really sounds to me like um, somebody had a buck to make. So my point is, this platform allows people to be able to share the ability to grow their own food and the knowledge with which to grow it. So I'm a huge fan and I do use the software myself. Uh, <coughs> open source beehives. Uh, unsurprisingly, as a gardener, I care greatly about our bee populations. And uh, this open source project um, is not just about open source software, it's also a maker project and you can download the plans to print 
Uh, there are various different types of beehives, so if you are a beekeeper, you can uh, create one of these. It's called a Colorado hive in your own backyard easily uh, with inexpensive materials and begin uh, nurturing the natural ecosystem through uh, the cultivation of pollinators. So uh, they also uh, provide IoT devices that do uh, hive monitoring, so health signs from bees based on the noises that they're making and the humidity in the hive and various other um, indicators of bee health. So uh, that's uh, an IoT application that I can get behind. Um, I, I don't feel too bad about surveilling our friends the bees, but I suppose at one point they might tell me that that was a bad idea. I'm fine with that. Signal. Do I need to tell anyone in the audience what signal is? Okay, that's, I'm so excited to see 100% knowledge. For those who may not know, uh, signal is an encrypted text messaging app with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, Signal is uh, particularly of interest to me in addition for the privacy that it affords me as a private citizen, but also because it has been uh, demonstrated time and time again to be the best possible communications tool for journalists or for whistleblowers and their uh, communications to let folks know about things that are happening in the world that ought not to remain secret. Uh, the Freedom of the Press Foundation is actually fundraising for Signal right now. Uh, if that is any demonstration of the degree to which this particular uh, software platform is important. And again, the code is free and open source software. Mastodon. So uh, an alternative to Twitter, and I admit to being a Twitter addict, um, that is, is actually seeming to take off both in that it is free and open source software, but also that people are willing to migrate from the Twitter platform to actually use it. So I am, my next goal as I rid myself of proprietary communications tools is to move to Mastodon. And uh, I would like to encourage folks to check it out and also contribute to the code base if that uh, means something to you. There have been quite a few accusations lobbied at the staff of Twitter about the voices that they suppress and the voices that they allow to continue speaking. Uh, and I don't wanna put uh, my time, attention, and energy into a platform that elevates messages of white supremacy uh, because I just don't think that that's the way that the world ought to go, and I hope everyone here is in agreement. So, excellent alternative. And last but not least, uh, a project that is near and dear to my heart because of my family, um, Indie. Indie's Better Blocker is a uh, blocker for tracking and adware on iOS devices. And for those of you in the audience who are wondering why that matters to me when we should all be going for an open source or free operating system like Android, this is my mobile phone. This is an iPhone 5S. It is, a, it is deeply outdated. It is, it is terribly, terribly crappy. And I use this phone specifically because everyone in my family does not have the wealth and privilege to be able to afford to buy a new phone every time there's a new edition that comes out. And I think that for some folks in the tech industry, that's the way that they live. And so I use this device because I want to see what kind of user experience my dear friend who teaches uh, immigrant children from Haiti and the Dominican Republic in the schools of Miami, what her daily life is like when she's trying to do most of her computing activities through a device like this that is not patched, it is uh, failing, the power consumption is ridiculous, and um, although it is the last iPhone edition where you can get a Peli case, which is really important for me because I'm dropping this thing all the time. So. Uh, anyway, so the Better Blocker is made by an organization called Indie. The code is free and open source software. And the Indie firm is a nonprofit organization that uh, is specifically focused on uh, ethical design. And you can read about ethical design principles on their website. And they're also exploring the development of federated personal websites to empower people with individual so sovereignty and a healthy commons in the digital networked age which I had to read because I would have never gotten that all into my brain at one time. So anyway, please do check this out and consider contributing. So not news, I think, to anyone in this audience, but I think it is very important for us to realize that though we, we care about free software, that free software alone is not going to be the thing that gets us through challenging times, right? We need to not only build resilient free software projects, we need to be able to effectively build participate in and give our service to resilient human systems. And I'm gonna talk about some real ways that we can actually do that. So, our problems are not technical, right? They are social. 
Um, I actually attended uh, Eleanor Sider's presentation at the 34th Chaos Communications Congress, and it was called No Neutral Ground in a Burning World. And one of the theses of the talk was that people who are engaged in the process of building surveillance systems and tools to hack dissidents and to otherwise uh, ensure the maintenance of the status quo for those in power uh, are all night, after their day jobs have concluded, writing free software to undo the work that they have done all day. And I think that that is, is absolutely true. And I think that the answer there, my friends, is it's time to stop building it, right? We, we have to understand that we can take an economic hit, we can take a career hit, we can take a reputation hit, we can take, uh, you know, our, our status may diminish if we refuse to build these systems, and that's okay, right? There is, uh, at a certain point, there's only, you know, your wine is only gonna get so much better, your, uh, your wealth is only gonna buy you so much, and for any of us who may have ever labor labored under the illusion that if we just choose the right technology employer, we too will end up on a star arc. You know, when things get bad, that's not actually going to happen. So my first advice to everyone in the audience, and I, I know how difficult it is to walk away from uh, an economic opportunity that means you will be, you know, wealthy, uh, just walk away, just don't build it. So if you find yourself in a position where technology that you have built is harming other people, you know, you can't unbuild what you have built, right? If your expertise went into making something that is creating a system of oppression for others, you can't change that, but you can do two things. One, you can try and exert influence on the employer who paid you to create these systems. And for anyone who is watching, I want you to learn from my failure and do not naively believe it when you are building technology that has negative implications, when someone tells you that if you are not the ones building it, someone else will just build it instead. And surely you know and trust all of the people around you to never put this application or this software package to poor use because the people that you work with will change. So learn from my naivete. Just don't build it. If you do build it, I, you know, again, try and influence its use and support the people who are protesting when these systems come and, and damage their lives. I want to take a minute to express my sincere gratitude to employees at Amazon, at Microsoft, and at Google who have signed open letters or walked out in protest of their company's actions when they have been harmful to underrepresented groups in society and to society at large based on what is being built. Um, in particular, this is a uh, photograph of a protest of Amazon based on their use of, or their sales of surveillance and facial recognition technology to the United States government, specifically the uh, folks who are, I don't know what ICE stands for. Immigration, we don't like you here because you're not the right human technology. Hmm? I'm sorry, I heard, of, tell me the acronym please. Immigration and Customs, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Enforcement, thank you. So, um, another thing that I think is very important for us all to realize in the free software uh, community, especially as we're all trying to evolve in our approach to how we do community building and how we are welcoming to others, is that we all really need to be compassionate. Uh, I've seen, particularly on social media, that there is just this impetus to uh, really jump on people for making mistakes and to lash out at them and to decide that because they made a, a single mistake that they are irredeemable. And I cannot emphasize enough that that is not useful behavior, right? It is important to exercise compassion and if someone makes a mistake, to address it with them directly. If someone is a bad actor in our communities, there is no reason that we need to continue to have them in our communities, but to assume with one mistake that someone is persona non grata forever is to effectively limit our ability to have power as a community because there is strength in numbers and there is strength in the ability to persuade one to your viewpoint and there is strength in being able to have peace when you will not agree, right? It's okay to not agree with someone. If they are the kind of person with whom you have decided you cannot break bread, that's okay too. 
but let's see if there's a way that we can balance these two ideas. Um, as I said, you know, calling in is actually, I think, for our communities, it's a survival mechanism, and I'm just gonna take a really quick aside here to address something that's been um, on my mind a lot lately. So uh, Nadia Eggball, who's done extensive research on the sustainability of free and open source software projects, particularly in the infrastructure space, has just started to do a podcast about the relationship between participation in free software projects and religious faith, and how she was surprised to discover the number of people who were involved in FOSS who, were, who would describe themselves as uh, Christians or deeply religious because this seems sort of antithetical. We are a community who tends to have a greater love for the flying spaghetti monster than other deities, as it were. So I think that there are a lot of times where we see that, that culture clash within our own community because there are, there are things that we believe uh, due to different you know, types of faith that are antithetical to others when they think about diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And I just want to say that uh, some of those opinions are never going to work well together. Um, I don't want to get a, a lot into specifics because they involve private conversations that I had with people who are no longer with us, but I think that the most important thing is even when someone vehemently disagrees with you, even when someone espouses beliefs that you find to be objectionable or abhorrent, if you can, and you are not someone who is specifically impacted by those beliefs, if you can ask them if they mean to hurt anyone with the way that they talk about their beliefs, I, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find that no one is actually actively trying to cause harm. And people will listen when you ask them to know their audience when they're expressing thoughts about their beliefs. And I don't wanna censor anyone, but there is a time and a place for everything, and to, be, and to be available and open to people who have ideas that are very different than yours, or ideas that if you're like me, you were raised with that you no longer agree with. Um, I think that again, this is essential to the ability of our community to function well. If we do not stand together, we will burn together. So other things that we can do. So uh, let's create businesses that actually support a better and more just world. I'm gonna take a moment to um, do a shameless plug for a startup that I advise. I will now go through a very long disclosure statement. I am a non-compensated, non-shareholding, non-board seat holding advisor to Token Labs. There we go, disclosure statement made. Um, the reason that I spend my time with the folks at Token Labs is because they have very explicitly left uh, large corporate jobs to create a sustainable business in the open embedded and IoT space where they are trying to support uh, the values of a better world. So they take it as one of their watchwords to ensure they hire a diverse staff. 80% of their full-time employees are women. They teach all of the folks who come to their organization who are not developers how to become developers and uh, open embedded or Yocto developers. Um, and if that's something that they choose to stick with, that's great. If not, they have a new skill set that they can bring to bear. Uh, and they also are focused on the concept of rural economic development, particularly because in Ireland, um, the outside of the big cities, economic mobility is simply non-existent. So one of the things that free software allows us to do is to create methods of livelihood serving communities that may be smaller, making less money, but making the money that we make the fuel that we need in a capitalist society, whether we agree, agree with capitalism or not, I'm pretty sure you figured out where I am on that one. Um, <laughs> so giving people the opportunity to earn their income in the most ethical way possible and in a way that supports the world and supports their own development as people. Um, next, if you can afford it, and I don't pretend for a moment that everyone in this room or everyone on the live stream is in the economic circumstances that I am, but if you have money and you can afford it, give of your wallet, right? There are all kinds of organizations that are supporting a better and more just world, including in free software. There's the Free Software Foundation, the Software Freedom Conservancy. I already mentioned freedom of the press. There's the Creative Commons folks, Wikipedia. I don't care what matters to you. Give your money to people who are spending their time and their energy to do this work that makes the world better and more sustainable if you can do it. And if you cannot do it, that's okay. There's no, there's no guilt and shame 
to be had or to feel like you're not doing enough. But if you can, please do this. I'm watching you know, billionaires in San Francisco uh, take each other down on social media about whether or not they're going to give money to support homeless people living in San Francisco. And I have to say that um, I'm glad to see the conversation in public has shifted more towards if you have wealth, how do we care for those who do not have it, as opposed to um, my yacht is pretty and now I have another yacht. So if you cannot give of yourself economically, if you can give of your time, that is also extremely valuable. And obviously, those of us in the room who are participating in free and open source pro software projects already understand what it is like to give of their time to those projects uh, on a volunteer basis. And that's important. I am not discounting the importance of that, but I, I also just want to urge all of us to remember that when we are giving of our time, we cannot give only to free software projects, right? Um, give your time to people. Give your time to the people in your community who need your help, right? So if your friend is depressed and cannot leave the house, take them to the pharmacy to get the medications that they need to be healthier. If you uh, you know, if there is someone who is walking behind you who is infirm, take the time to wait and hold the door open for them. Take time to make sure that your everyday actions reinforce pro-social behaviors because I think one of the other reasons why people do not act to make the world a better place is because all they have seen is the large-scale reward for poor behavior. And if through each of our actions every day, we reinforce that we are all in this together and we must all be of service to one another, then I think that we will, again, enforce behavior that says we will create a better world for all and it's not all about F you, I've got mine. And frankly, I think also one of the, th the greatest battle I think that we need to fight is, is our busyness and our cynicism, right? Where everything is going terribly, we will never be able to fix it. And I'm so busy, I can't possibly spend time doing things to make the world a better place. I just have to keep my head down. I just have to keep going. I just have to worry about getting through this. I just have to worry about protecting my, my small circle of human beings. Um, I get it, right? I'm a mom. I would do anything to protect my child, but I also have to consistently remind myself that taking the time to cook for seniors in our community who probably don't have sufficient food is an important use of my time and teaching her why we're doing it and that we're doing it together is an important part of socializing her as a human being who understands her responsibilities to others as much as she understands her responsibility to her immediate family living in her own house. Uh, I think that this is uh, another, well at least it's important for me and I can assume it's probably important for, for uh, other folks in the audience who self-identify as nerds. Um, Give to yourself, right? I think we spend an awful lot of time consuming uh, science fiction or, you know, even non-science fiction like Mr. Elton writes that, that shows a, a very ugly future for humanity, for our planet, uh, for, for all of us, right? And, and frankly, that is unhealthy. You know, there is a phrase, you are what you eat, and we think it only applies to food but it applies just as much to what we put into our minds. Um, operating forever in an environment of despair and what is going to wrong next, go wrong next paralyzes our ability to make positive, positive forward progress because what we have consumed tells us that it is an unwritten, uh, inevitable conclusion that we will fail. So be kind to yourself. You know, I love my sci-fi as much as the next person, but maybe like, you know, read Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed about you know, making colonies in space that have a, an anarchistic equality for all overtone instead of, uh, well, all of it, really. Don't watch Terminator, it's not as fun. Um, this one is something that I don't have an answer to, but I think it's critical. Uh, I think we need in the free software community to understand how we can take the power of the communities that we build online and the ties that we are able to form with one another in a virtual setting and figure out how to take them offline. And I don't think that it's so much that we need to be able to answer this question. I think it's that we need to be able to understand how to plug in with communities that are not specifically focused on online interaction to bring our skills and talents to bear on what folks are doing either in activist circles 
for human rights organizations, for any group of people who is trying to challenge a social system which rewards um, profit at all costs to the detriment of everything else. So I just want to invite everyone who is listening to this presentation to, to think about the, the virtues that you have learned through your online interactions, the power that you've been able to bring to those interactions, and, and to think about how we can do those in an offline world, particularly because um, I am not an extrovert. I play one on stage. Talking to other people is very hard. Um, so I've, I've had to do a lot of work to try and be able to do uh, in-person communication and in-person interactions that support others around me. And I think we all need to, to think a lot about how we want to do that because the world needs our voices and the world needs our strength. I want to conclude with a story that uh, moves me greatly. Um, and also a shout out to someone who has always given me love and support, my friend Jen. She and I uh, were together last week at a, uh, a meeting in Boston. And she was telling me about how she had just visited with the executive director of a charity that services uh, unhoused people in the Denver, Colorado area. And for various assorted reasons, Denver has a very large homeless population. And the executive director of the organization said that uh, people do not get involved and they do not try and help people who need help because they are so overwhelmed by the problem and it is so sad and it is so difficult and it is so much more than they can possibly solve on their own. And so they, they choose to look away instead of to engage because this is easier for them. It is not a cognitive burden that they can bear and that's completely understandable. And he said what he wanted everyone in the audience who was at this informational session to take away was that transformation is so much easier than you think. He said, I want everyone in the room to tell me what they think when I ask our clients in the homeless community, what is the most transformative experience that you have had? You know, what, what, what meant the most to you when someone did something for you? Was it that they got you a cup of coffee? Like, what was it? And without exception, every single person has told him that the most important thing for them has been when someone asked what their name was. It wasn't that they gave them money. It wasn't that they got them food. It was that someone cared enough to see them again as a human being and to ask them who they were and what their story was. And that that was something that gave them strength to carry through when they were facing the most difficult of circumstances. Transformation is so much easier than we think it is because we have been taught that the only victory is a complete victory and that is a falsehood that paralyzes us and traps us in inaction. Do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you can take a step forward that is only a centimeter, that is better than standing still. So my, con my absolute concluding remarks, I'm gonna take a sip of water really quick. So I didn't really know how to end this talk because the way that I was raised uh, tends to be a little bit more aggressive and I, th I think to myself when I think about the challenges we face, um, if, we're, if we're gonna lose, I wanna go out fighting, right? And that, that gives me strength, but it also reminds me that, that that's a byproduct of a culture that uh, espouses, uh, let's just face it, violence as, a, as an operating paradigm, and that's not what I want. So instead, uh, I wanna leave us with something that I found equally moving at a time when I had more despair than I had comfort. Uh, and this quote is attributed to Martin Luther. I have no idea who really said it. And that was, even if I knew that the world would end tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. Whatever your apple tree is, my friends, I beg of you to plant it with me and let a thousand flowers bloom. Thank you. <laughs>